Right. So uh, I got into the addiction field in kind of an unusual way. Uh, I started out my uh, my training and my residency at the University of Maryland, and I was finding that the patients that I had the most difficulty with were patients with addictions. And so when I completed my residency, I thought if I'm going to be a competent psychiatrist, I need to kind of expand my ability into addiction. So I did a fellowship. And I did find that to be very enjoyable. I really love addictions and uh, I feel quite comfortable in the addictions field now and it made a big, big difference in my practice of psychiatry. So this uh, sculpture is called the Freedom Sculpture. It's, uh, it was made by Zenas Frudakis and it's in Philadelphia in the front of the GlaxoSmithKline Pharmaceutical Company. And so it kind of gives you a good image of the emancipation of people who have addictions to recovery. So I like that image. All right, next slide, please. So I have no financial disclosures for this talk. Next slide. So here are the objectives for what I'm gonna talk about. First, what makes addiction cases challenging? Uh, basically, it boils down to the complexity in addictions cases. And I'm gonna describe how complexity impacts outcome. I'm gonna discuss how to formulate cases. I'm gonna describe the module strategy to address patient complexity. I'm going to cover an overview of treatment approaches. I'm going to discuss the scientific basis for recovery. And I'm going to cover an overview of recovery strategies and then we'll go over some sample cases. Next slide. So Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, bad times have a scientific value. These are occasions that a good learner would not miss. And so although people have terrible troubles, they're an opportunity for us to learn how to tackle these things. Next slide. So uh, the relapse rate for drug addiction are quite high, about 40 to 60%. And this kind of matches other chronic uh, medical conditions like diabetes and hypertension and asthma. My point here is that there's a lot of room for improvement in the quality of care that we deliver uh, for people with drug addiction. Next slide. So uh, this African proverb, smooth seas don't make skilled sailors. So if all of the cases were simple for us to treat, then uh, we wouldn't be very skilled uh, addiction psychiatrists or addiction medicine uh, physicians. Okay, next slide. So in the addictions field, they talk about somebody having a monkey on their back. And I like this image, you know, of an octopus on this guy's back. It's, this is really kind of the sort of severity of trouble that people come presenting with. Next slide. So the traditional medical model uh, really applies only to straightforward cases. And the way the medical model works is that the person's, count, they're a manageable pile of snakes is reduced to a single manageable snake, or they have a complex set of symptoms that can be reduced to a single diagnosis, a single manageable diagnosis with an evidence-based treatment. And so the goal of the medical model is to address the root cause of the problem. And as you're going to see with complex cases, it's more involved than that. Okay, next slide. So how do we tackle challenging or complex cases? Well, first of all, it, it requires some pattern recognition. And so what you wanna do is apply the best evidence-based approaches to the whole clinical situation. And uh, the complexity can get pretty crowded and uncertain with some of these cases. And what happens is that multi multidisciplinary teams break down the complex problems into modules, and I'll explain how to do that. And then we integrate the solutions of all these modules and problems into a coherent whole. Okay, next slide. So what you're basically doing with the module approach is breaking the journey down into small steps. And when you have a module approach, it reveals talent gaps in an addiction program. So if there's a module that your program is not able to resolve, patients are not going to do as well. And so it kind of really ex expresses what the difficulties are with an addiction program. And so you really want to get a taxonomy or a a classification of the patient's problems into modules, and that allows for a clear and confident response to the group of problems patients face. And what you want to do is align the patient's needs with the right people, or prescriptive instruction manuals about how to address the problems they have. Next slide. 
So what is a complex addiction? Well, Dave McDuff, he's the lead psychiatrist for the Orioles and the Colts, and he's an addiction specialist. He developed this model of complex addictions, and I've expanded on his model. But basically, there's multiple uh, kind of domains that can make a case complex. And the first domain is multiple substances make a case complex, and especially when there's upper and downer pairing. So Kantian developed a concept called the self-medication hypothesis of addictions. And what he thought is that people are trying to palliate their emotional turmoil, whether if they're depressed and they want to use an upper, if they're anxious, they want to use a downer. But sometimes patients are using uppers and downers like amphetamines and alcohol or uh, methamphetamine and, and opiates. So that upper downer pairing makes it much more complex. And then risky routes of administration make it more complex. So it's the, the speed of onset of action of a substance that makes it most addictive. And so when someone is smoking or injecting, the onset of action is very rapid because the drug gets to the brain so quickly. And smoking especially and injecting is right behind it. So risky routes, of, and there's other things that are risky about these methods of administration. There's a lot of medical comorbidity related to injecting and smoking. So that makes it complex as well. And that kind of leads to the next area of complexity, which is serious medical, psychiatric comorbidity and cognitive impairment. So it's very common for people with addictions to have a psychiatric comorbidity, and you'll see some data on that in a little bit. And then also underemployment and low education can cause complexity. And concurrent dealing or criminality can make cases more complex. And then past or ongoing trauma or loss make it complex. Addiction during pregnancy is an added complexity. And then a multiple concurrent addiction types like sex and substances and food and gambling and shopping and video gaming. So all these behavioral addictions can make uh, substance use disorders more complex. Next slide, please. And then you can have complex social factors which make cases more complex. So someone may have deep association with a marginalized group or gang affiliation, or they may be in a culture where there's high addiction stigma that can make cases more complex, or family dysfunction or divorce. So all these social factors can make cases more complex. And then some patients kind of languish, they get stuck in an unpleasant situation and can't find their way out of it. And they may have persistent dysfunction in their relationships or work or school, or poverty or homelessness, and they may languish, kind of be stuck in this way, and that can make cases more complex. And then also early life and late life addiction cases are more complex. So I've, I've treated patients when I was in Baltimore who were as young as 14 or 13 who were already in the throes of addiction. And so it can start at a very early age. And then there's the elderly folks who have trouble with alcohol or other drugs. Uh, and can have addictions at, at that point in life. And it can be much more complex to deal with those cases. And then lastly, prominent individuals with a significantly developed career uh, can have addictions, and that is more complex. And one reason that it's complex is because their illness affects so many other people, because they're important figures. And also the, the incidence of shame is so much more prominent in people who have significantly developed careers. And so when you, when you think of a complex addiction, it's usually not just one of these factors, but maybe multiple factors that make the case complex. Okay, next slide. So let's look at some of the statistics about complexity. This is the uh, National Survey on Drug Use and Health. And in 2014, 43.6 million Americans had some form of mental illness and about 20.2 million had a substance use disorder in the last year. And out of those, 11.3% had both an alcohol and illicit drug use disorder. And 7.9 million had both a substance use disorder and a mental disorder. So you can see how it's a, these are very common co-occurrences and the complexity is, is almost the norm as opposed to someone who's just a straightforward individual with an addiction. And then in 2012, 5.9% of pregnant women use illicit drugs and 8.5% drank alcohol. So that's some of the data about the complexity. Next slide. 
So there's something called the Addiction Severity Index. Uh, Tom McClellan, I think he was at Yale, I'm not quite sure. Uh, he developed this model of looking at addiction and said basically there's seven areas of function that uh, are impacted by substance use. And so it gives you kind of a general overview of the substance use problem. And those areas are medical status, employment, drug use, alcohol use, legal status, family and social status, and psychiatric status. Next slide. So McClellan's done a lot of research about the ASI, and this goes all the way back to 1998. Uh, he was looking at people who re-entered treatment. And what he found is that people who come back to treatment for more treatment tend to have higher ASI profiles. And so there's needs that are not being met in their first uh, course of treatment that lead to them recurring and, and having more substance use issues and needing more treatment. So the, the, the kind of the complex problems that the patients are facing are not being addressed and they're just maybe focusing too much on addiction alone and not looking at the whole patient situation. Next slide. So how do you make changes in someone's complex dynamic system? And uh, Rusk and, and that group uh, in 2018 wrote a nice article about how complex system change works. And so just one change in a single module may fail to tip the system into a new stable state. And changes within multiple modules can have a synergistic effect that tips the state into a stable pattern. And unchanged parts of the system may undermine the attempt to change leading to relapse. And changes in one module can spill over into others, so that can lead to greater stability. And particularly potent changes in the system with a good fit for the individual may promote other useful changes in an upward spiral. Next slide. So here's a good diagram of what I'm talking about. So if you look at this balance, uh, if you just have one change in all the modules, then you're likely to have relapse because it hasn't really stabilized. But if you look down at D where there's multiple changes, multiple domains uh, changing, then it tips into a new stable state and you get stabilization and, and kind of the new way of life. And so that's what we're striving for is kind of creating stabilization by affecting multiple modules at once. All right, next slide. All right, so this is the Center for Hope and Healing. Uh, it's the WVU's uh, uh, inpatient rehabilitation program and detox program. And uh, it's a beautiful facility if you haven't been there. But anyway, uh, Dave McDuff, who I was telling you is the lead psychiatrist for the Orioles and the Colts, uh, he describes addictions treatment as having this kind of pathway. And so first you cut down or stop, then they get comfortable, then they establish life balance and lifestyle change, and then they can finish trauma work and personal growth and development. Next slide. So the first process that we have to work with patients on in changing their behavior is motivation and enhancement. And so in order to change a behavior, you have to have leverage. There has to be something that impels the person to change their behavior. And so often we use something called motivational interviewing. And the key to that is to develop a discrepancy between where the person's life is now and where they want it to be. And that's what motivates a person to change. And also you can have aversive substance related experiences as critical moment motiva uh, motivators. And so the goal is to get from resistance and denial to readiness to motivation or getting them to be concerned, convinced, committed, and then build confidence. And what happens when you motivate patients is something gets through to them, a light goes on. And they just kind of recognize that, yes, there is, there's something that needs to be addressed here. I really need help. Next slide. So what else do we offer in addictions treatment? Well, these are kind of the common approaches. So we have relapse prevention and cognitive behavioral therapy. And that's about addressing high-risk situations that are likely to cause relapse so that a person is prepared for their toughest situations. 12-step facilitation or mutual support which is working with somebody who has a sponsor, is working the steps of AA and NA, uh, and facilitating that process in, in psychotherapy. 
And then network therapy, which was developed by Gallanter, is about using the family of someone who has an addiction and using that as leverage to change their behavior. And also other people who are concerned about the individual, they can be involved in the treatment of the patient. And uh, so you, they may transport the patient to meetings or get them to their medical appointments and, and create, not don't enable addiction through having substances in the house and giving them money to use substances. So all that kind of stuff has to get reined in. So in, in a network support of therapy. And then we have pharmacologic treatments. So the, the FDA approved treatments are for nicotine, alcohol, and opiates. We do have treatments for methamphetamine and cocaine uh, that are not FDA approved, but uh, there's a lot of room for improvement in the pharmacologic treatment of substance use disorders. And then acupuncture can be helpful. Group therapy and an inspirational group membership can be helpful. Mindfulness, which comes from the psychology of Buddhism, is very helpful. People get an equanimity and uh, kind of a detached state of mind that helps them to cope with stressors and uh, feel more calm and at peace. And then peer coaching. So working with somebody who's had success in recovery is inspiring and they have a lot of answers to the kind of challenges that people face uh, in recovering. Next slide. So there's levels of care that are based upon needs. And so what are the levels of care that we offer? So first we have early intervention and then low intensity outpatient treatment and then intensive outpatient or partial hospitalization, inpatient rehab and medically managed inpatient. And so a core principle of addictions treatment is that if the patient fails the current level of care, you wanna intensify the treatment. So if they're failing a level of care, you don't wanna you know, discharge them from treatment or kick them out of treatment. You wanna offer them more treatment. And that does a couple of things. So one, it requires more time uh, on the patient's behalf to, to get them more treatment. And so it's an incentive for them to work on their recovery so they don't have to spend so much time in treatment. And also you're offering them more treatments so they're getting better care. And then if someone is doing well, then you, you lower the intensity of the treatment and gradually move them toward the lowest level. Okay, next, next slide, please. So building self-control is really the key to having an ability to maintain abstinence. And so the key to building self-control is for patients to think through the consequences of the behavior. And that includes the unintended consequences and the consequences of the consequences. And so in AA, they talk about thinking through the drink or playing the tape through. And so if the person can, if the person has an urge to use a substance and they think it through and think, now where does this lead me? No, I just don't wanna live that way anymore. It doesn't work for me. If they can think through like that, that helps them curb their, their urge to use and rein in that behavior. And so when a person breaks through and overcomes the urge, and has success staying sober, the process gets easier. The more success they have with incidents like that, the, the better and better it gets for them. Next slide. So how does the relapse process work? Well, basically there's different things that can trigger relapse, negative emotional states and stress, overwhelming complexity, interpersonal conflict, social pressure, conditioned craving, lack of satiety, and mental fatigue. Uh, so all those processes can lead to relapse. Next slide. And then also there's uh, kind of substance misuse personal personality traits that are risk factors for addiction. And these come from Dave McDuff again. So uh, you've got low harm avoidance, high risk taking, high impulsivity, high sensation seeking, poor self-care and self-preservation and low uh, self-esteem. So all those personality traits can lead to addiction. Now, people may say I have an addictive personality and I don't really like that term, but there are traits that people can have that can predispose someone to having addictive behavior. And these are those. Next slide. So what is recovery? Well, recovery is the sober and productive lifestyle of individuals who successfully, successfully resolved dependence on alcohol and or other drugs and uh, it's, a, it's a maintained lifestyle. So a person is recovering 
or in recovery rather than recovered. And so it means learning to live without drugs and alcohol, whether you uh, have negative feelings or you can enjoy life without using drugs or alcohol. And Austin Brown and Robert Ashford say that successful long-term recovery is a fundamentally emancipatory set of processes. And what they're saying is that it frees one from the bondage of pathology. So you can kind of think of that first slide uh, with that image of the freedom sculpture, you know, that they're emancipated from this bondage that they're in. Next slide. So how does the addictions recovery process work? Well, most importantly, recovery is about taking care of yourself. And it has basically three components, abstinence, well-being, and giving back. And by abstinence, it may be incomplete abstinence. So some patients, you know, they may not be totally, completely abstinent. They may once in a while slip up, but for the most part, they've got their substance use under pretty good control. And that's really, you know, a, a successful kind of a recovery. I think total abstinence is ideal, but there can be cases of incomplete abstinence. And then well-being, that's about personal growth and development and giving back or citizenship or service to others. All three of these areas are important to recovery. Next slide. So let's talk about abstinence. So we talked about motivation and treatment, but what, how does it come from the patient? And basically everyone who gets involved in recovery has a why. And so you can find out what that is by asking a patient who comes to you, how come you're here getting help? And so there's usually some kind of factor, some leverage that makes them want to get help, and that's their why. And so here's the common one. So escalating consequences of substance use or other addictive behavior, pressure from family, friends, or employer, legal trouble, health concerns, wanting to be a responsible parent, so maybe they lost custody of their children and they want to be able to be responsible for their children, tired of the, the lifestyle and they want to move forward. And Day in 2002 did a study of people who were in recovery and they found that 46% reported escalating consequences of substance use as the most common why. Next slide. So also surrendering is so important and basically what it boils down to is a patient deciding, you know, this life just, just doesn't work for me. And there's a surrendering, you know, that they can't, they can't do it a little bit or once in a while or be a social drinker. That life doesn't work for them. It gets out of control. And so it's getting to those consequences that makes them realize, yeah, it's just not a possible life for me. Next slide. So this is uh, abstinence talking about high risk situations. So this gets to the kind of cognitive behavioral or relapse prevention therapy. But what basically what this is about is that patients need a toolbox of approaches to deal with the toughest situations where relapse risk is the greatest. And so uh, there's strategies to do this and it's really important to work with patients and come up with some strategies. And if they can face the toughest situations, they're ready for anything. And so they got to really think through what would be the most difficult scenario for me. And so it may mean calling someone with a long period of sobriety for support or finding something healthy and relaxing and enjoyable to do instead of slipping back into substance use, like taking a relaxing bath or going for a nice easy walk or hike or going for a relaxing drive or having a nice picnic lunch or a dip in the pool or stargazing or a yoga session or going to a museum or coffee shop or exercising. So there's lots of things that people can do to cope with urges to use and deal with high-risk situations. Next slide. So what about social group reconstruction? Well, that's also important for abstinence. And so you have to become aware of what types of foods, drinks, drugs, thoughts, conversations, and people you invite into your life. And so ideally you wanna surround yourself with solid people who wish you well and support your sobriety. And of course, find a loving mentor. And so often I have to talk with patients about, you know, what is your social group like? And you know, you're gonna to have to get these numbers out of your phone that there are all these people who use substances that are triggers for you. Or maybe you need to get rid of your phone and get a new phone. You know, so they gotta really change their social group. Next slide. And then also you wanna have good recovery environments. 
and Brown and Ashford talk about recovery ready communities. And so a recovery ready community has recovery residences and recovery employment environments and recovery educational environments. You know, WVU has a program for recovery. Uh, drug courts, recovery oriented community centers or drop in centers, peer recovery services or recovery coaches, recovery community organizations, coffee houses, gyms recreation centers. And so the resources that you have are what are called community recovery capital. And you also wanna have re community recovery readiness. And that's the perception that the, the resources that are available are useful to the public, to families who are affected by addiction and the recovering individuals. Next slide. So also stress recovery is very important in abstinence. And so people have to have unwinding routines. And so here's somebody taking a nice bath with candles, but the, it's, it, this is important in every walk of life is to have unwinding routines. And uh, stress recovery is really the new fitness. So, uh, you know, you think of fitness like physical fitness and being mentally tough, uh, you know, and uh, endurance and strength and, and flexibility but actually stress recovery is a new kind of fitness. And so you have to have an unwinding routines to let go of stress. Next slide. So also distress tolerance is important to recovery. And so people with substance use disorders may feel like life is so unbearable it requires anesthesia. And uh, that can grow out of the adverse childhood experiences. I don't know if you learned about the adverse childhood experiences scale. Uh, and also psychiatric disorders can kind of predispose someone to having a lot of distress. And so what are the strategies? Well, first of all, you can soften into pain and distress. So people come, become so tense and forceful with dealing with distress, and it's actually better to soften into it. I work at the pain clinic, uh, working with people who have comorbid addictions and psychiatric disorders along with pain. And there is a kind of a a real skill at softening, in, softening into pain. And also dispositional joy is so important. So this can be a spiritual practice that gives you that calm, quiet, serene feeling. Uh, it may come from just uh, a belief in some basic principle that's important to you. And that can give you dispositional joy. And then looking at distress as this too shall pass, so we separate ourselves from suffering by realizing this is a temporary situation and things will change. And then detachment can be so helpful. So to, to not be so engrossed, but to step back and be detached can, can help with uh, distress tolerance. And then stress inoculation can help. So if you think about a flu shot, if you, if you have a flu shot, you inject the virus into your body, and your body fights it off. And then when you're exposed to the flu, you're resilient to it. And so stress is really the same way. You know, when we go through stressful experiences, they may be miserable and tough and you hate it, but you get through it. And then the next time you're exposed to a stressor, you're like, oh, that's not so bad. I've been through so much. And so we do get inoculated by stress. So you have to have stress recovery, but you want to kind of welcome stress in your life. And so that'll help with distress tolerance if you can kind of look at that model is that stress can be good for you in some ways. And then lastly, we divide, we uh, develop distress tolerance by differentiating good pain from bad pain. And what do I mean by good pain? Well, that's the pain associated with improvement or exercise fitness pain. And we can enlarge the concept of good pain if you can find a silver lining in the pain that you're experiencing. Is this making you improve in life in some way? Uh, so if you can find a silver lining and, and turn it in some ways to good pain, that can help with distress tolerance. Next slide. So also healthy activities and hobbies are important to abstinence. And so, and that includes work and education. And so all those things give life richer meaning and purpose, and it helps to fend off idle time and boredom. And so when patients tell me that they're bored and that's why they think of using substances, I don't say, well, you need entertainment to deal with boredom. That's really not the answer. The antidote to boredom is goals. And so if you have a goal in your life, then it gives you something to be doing. 
And so you can wake up in the morning thinking, you know, what is my goal? What do I need to work on? And how can I move in that direction in some way? Next slide. And then also radical shifts in identity are so important to abstinence. And Brown and Ashford talk about this in their article in 2019. And so you don't want to settle for a stunted identity. It's who you become that matters most. So patients may have a lot of negative self images that they have about maybe mistakes that they've made or things that they've done. And, uh, and so it's who you become that matters most. That's where the rubber meets the road. And so it's really important for patients to think about what they're be, who they're becoming. And also, you want to kind of make that shift. So like with someone who smokes cigarettes, it's, go, it's shifting from viewing themselves as a smoker to viewing themselves as a non-smoker, to make that shift in self-image. And so they want to form a robust and empowered identity and build a solid psychological core of lovability and self-worth. And that's really what identity is most about, is that core of lovability and self-worth. And it's who you become with that. You, how lovable and, and worthwhile can you become? And also you identify with those ideas and people you admire. Next slide. So also recovery schemas can be important. And so there's like certain ways of viewing things that can help in recovery. And so it might be, I've got something to prove or I'll thrive in spite of them, or I love life and that's why I'll work on recovery or living a good life is the best revenge, or I hope God believes in me, or you bring out my best. So all these recovery schemas can be helpful in abstinence. Next slide. So what about well-being? So the three components of recovery, abstinence, well-being, and giving back. So well-being is about love, work, and health. Freud said that mental health is lo to love and to work. But I think health, of course, is also important in well-being. And so how do you achieve well-being? Well, you have assembly of discrete parts. You can have growth of systems. You have to mitigate problems. And ultimately, that leads to health confidence. And health confidence means looking well, feeling well, thinking well, and doing well. Next slide. So what is an assembly of discrete parts? Well, so these are things like the right food, and you can see that people have written about the impact of the right food on recovery, and empowering yourself through fitness, restorative sleep, the right mindset, so a stubborn hope or conditional optimism is better than pessimism for your mindset, and mental toughness, like having great self-talk and visualization, and managing this, the distractions that try to get you off focus from your goals, and caring and cooperation, being trustworthy and having deep responsibility and just being a giving person, and to glide well socially, and building your favorable reputation among knowledgeable people, and to build financial security and economic strength, and building beautiful beauty into your life. So make something beautiful of your life. All those are kind of the assembly of discrete parts. Next slide. And then we also have the growth of systems. And basically the growth of systems and well-being come from your environment. You know, that it, you can design your environment to stimulate the growth of excellent love, work, and health. And so if we can have an enriching environment, that's going to result in the best optimization of growth bottom up. And so it's in the interaction of genes and environment. So if you think about who we become, it's the interaction of our genetic profile and the environmental impact on that. And so why not uh, be, you know, don't be passive about your environment, make it great. And so the genius of nature can be harnessed. And so this is essentially what natural recovery comes from, which means that some people can recover from addictions kind of in a natural way. And I think a lot of this is really about, uh, you know, your environment and, and how enriching your environment and healthy your environment is. And uh, Prochaska and De Clementi talked about the stages of change in natural recovery. So pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. But I think it requires an environment to facilitate that process. Next slide. So also you need to mitigate problems. And first of all, that requires managing the drama and dark psychological games of life. You know, that there can be issues in life that can distract you from what's most important. And so you have to be able to manage those. 
And also, it's rather than just problem solve, you want to become a problem seeker and look around and see what needs to be fixed and figure out what's wrong and resolve it. And the key to this is to figure out what are the basic principles at play. And so well-being depends on mitigating problems. Next slide. So what about health confidence? What is that about? Well, it's looking well, feeling well, thinking well, and doing well. And looking well, you can see that in the gleam in someone's eyes or the, the nuances of health confident posture, or walking with confidence or confident subtle gestures. And feeling well, you can hear that in the emotion tone in someone's voice. You know, do they sound confident and healthy or do they, is there some aspect to their emotion tone that makes you wonder if they're having trouble? And then thinking well, so that basically means mitigating problems and constructing a flourishing life. That's what thinking well is about. And doing well, so thriving, having deep confidence, and, and a favorable, favorable reputation among knowledgeable people. So that's what doing well is like. Next slide. So the last area of recovery, so abstinence, well-being, and giving back. And what is giving back? Uh, so community service work is important in giving back and then helping others and particularly helping those in early recovery and it gives you a transcendent feeling. Now I don't advise patients who are in early recovery to get involved in helping other people in early recovery because they're going to be triggered by the person who's struggling. But uh, as you get more time in recovery and you've uh, achieved some sober time, I think it's helpful to help others and give back and that's kind of the spirit of AA and NA is to be a support for people in early recovery. And then citizenship, to be a good neighbor, respect the environment, vote. So all that is part of giving back. Next slide. So ideally we need to develop outcome measures that go beyond days of abstinence to reflect you know, how well someone is doing with addictions recovery. And so we need to be able to look at general health and quality of life and general functioning also, you know, that maybe just at days of abstinence is not an adequate measure. And so we want to develop an evidence-based science of recovery that can apply to everyone, you know, everyone in recovery. And Gardens, the recovery group, with resolve and humility into a crisp operation and have a stronger recovery community. Next slide. So it's psychologically easier to build a new healthy behavior than to simply rip out the problem behavior as though it were a weed. And so that's why well-being is so important in recovery. You know, we're not just gonna remove the substance use problem or the addictive behavior. There has to be some positive behaviors that are developing as part of the recovery process. Next slide. So how long does treatment take? Uh, in general, patients with substance use disorders are recommended to stay engaged for at least a year in treatment. But uh, Nora Bolkow, who is the director of NIDA, says it's really a five-year process uh, to heal the addicted brain. And it can be longer for some people, but on average, about five years is what we're talking about uh, for the best outcomes. And so people gradually move to less and less intensive levels of care over those five years. And ideally, we want to have treatment on demand and assertive outreach. So if someone comes to the emergency room with a substance-related issue, we should get them into treatment right away. That's the goal. Okay, next slide. So here's some cases. Um, you know, these cases are not actual cases, but composites of many years of clinical work uh, that I think are a good example. So let's go over the cases. First case, next slide. 29-year-old male with a history of severe opiate use disorder, cocaine use disorder, and alcohol use disorder, an unspecified depressive disorder, uh, who's been treated for two years with Suboxone, Antabuse, and Celexa. He is very intelligent and enjoys reading the Harvard Business Review. He has supported himself for years by dealing drugs in the local community and has faced some incarcerations for possession and distribution. He had a long-term relationship with a beautiful young lady who left him because of his persistent languishing state of little to no growth, of not going anywhere. He remained fixated on the woman he never worked others than some infrequent solo music gigs. Eventually, after years of treatment in which he was rather stable psychiatrically, he relapsed to cocaine and alcohol use. He failed intensive outpatient level of care, antabuse and camperol. 
He was sent to inpatient rehab and following his discharge relapsed again and then refused to go back to the rehab and was administratively detoxed off the Suboxone. His addictions therapist saw him as entitled and resistant to change. He revealed his guilt and that maybe he was sabotaging himself as a way of punishing himself for past misdeeds. And he was feeling particularly guilty for introducing his best friend to drugs who was living a terrible life in and out of jail. So what makes this case complex? Any ideas? He uses multiple substances. Yes, yeah, so multiple substances. What else? Does he have up or down or pairing? Yeah, so he's using cocaine and alcohol and opiates, so uppers and downers, so that's more complex. What are any, Anything else you see in there for the complexity? He also has some sort of unspecified depressive disorder. Yep, so he's got psychiatric comorbidity. Mm -hmm. And legal issues. Yep, so criminal behavior, dealing, you know. Any other, what about languishing? So he's kind of stuck in this situation. He's not improving. He has a dysfunctional relationship. So we have to meet the needs of this individual as much as possible. So what do you think is the answer to help this guy? So he's failing the highest level of care and ref refusing treatment. So we need leverage, right? There has to be some motivating factor that's gonna motivate him to take care of himself. So it really requires getting back to his why. You know, what is, the, what is his reason that he wants help? And you know, is it because he's negatively impacted his friend and he, he needs to kind of live a better life? He wants a girlfriend and a stable relationship and live a good life. So we gotta get at the why. So when someone's not motivated, that, you know, that's the most important thing is to get at the why and have some leverage and, Work, work at motivating them, and then get him to the appropriate level of care and meet his needs, correct? All right, you ready for the next case? Next slide, please. So there's his, comp that's why the case is complex. I think we got all that. All right, next slide. So this next case is a 38-year-old male with no prior psychiatric history who presented with depression and suicide thoughts with plans for suicide in the context of cocaine use and he smokes the cocaine. And he feels unsafe and predicts that he will end his life if he doesn't get help. He is a bit childlike in character. His father left the family when he was young. He has an estranged relationship with his stepbrother due to incest. He has never had a depressive episode in the absence of drug use. During his hospitalization, he reported sex acts with dogs, which distra is distressing to him, and he refused to further discuss his behavior during his hospitalization. His use of cocaine is out of control. It has caused consequences in several domains of life. He's experienced tolerance to the drug and withdrawal symptoms. Next slide. So here's the diagnosis, cocaine use disorder, uh, cocaine-induced depressive disorder with onset during withdrawal, and other specified paraphilic disorder, zoophilia. So what do you think about this case? Why is this case complex? So he has past trauma um, with his stepbrother and also the risky uses of administration with smoking the cocaine. Right, so risky use of administration. He's got other addictive behaviors. Zoophilia is really considered a psychiatric disorder, not an addiction, but it's really, a, it's an addictive kind of, but the, so maybe this guy is using cocaine and then sleeping with animals. So, it, you know, it's like part of the addiction process. So there's kind of multiple addictions here. Anything else? Let's look at the next slide. All right, so multiple addiction types, risky routes of administration, languishing, psychiatric comorbidities, complex social factors, and loss, yeah. So he, he lost his relationship with his stepbrother and his father left when he was young, so complex social factors. So you, you really need to meet the needs of this patient as much as possible. And there is a pharmacologic treatment of zoophilia that you can reduce the sex drive in somebody who has a paraphilia and that can help with that behavior. 
and then uh, you know you have to address this cocaine use disorder, uh, you know, with with all the different avenues that we have. And he sounds pretty motivated. You know, he, he wants recovery, so uh, it's really about relapse prevention and looking at the consequences and uh, uh, you know network therapy and and twelve uh, step facilitation. And then meeting his needs. So does he have a good social group and has his environment, that kind of thing, right? Anything else, you guys? All right, next case. Next slide, please. All right, 35-year-old female with a history of PTSD, opiate and alcohol use disorders, who was injured in a motor vehicle collision and had several serious fractures requiring surgery. She was treated on Suboxone for pain in her opiate use disorder, titrated to 12 milligrams, three milligram total dose per day, divided into a third of that three times a day with a partial analgesic response. She is in physical therapy to improve her range of motion. She has intrusive memories of the accident, but no longer has nightmares of it. She denies being under the influence at the time of the accident, and there was a, no DUI charge. She's taking Zoloft 50 milligrams a day for PTSD. She's able to drive. She doesn't startle as much as she did following the accident. And she now has a softer vigilance. She has degrees in marketing and communication. Whoops, back. She has degrees in marketing and uh, communication, but works as a waitress. She resumed work at a restaurant, but her environment is filled with substance users, including coworkers and at the bar in the restaurant. She socializes with coworkers and drinks alcohol heavily at times. She was started on Campril and Antabuse after a period of absence from alcohol while in the hospital, but she became non-compliant with both of them after her discharge. She lives alone and there is no one available to supervise her taking the Antabuse to guarantee compliance with it. She has been absent from opiates with the current treatment with Suboxone. She was raised in a religious family and they have banished her from the family because of her substance use and, in their view, immoral lifestyle. And the family problems and underemployment are her only perceived consequences of substance use. So what do you guys think about this? What makes this case complex? Lack of social support. Yeah, so she's, she's got social factors. She's estranged from her family. There's a, there's a stigma issue that's contributing to it. And if, if you were going to use like Gallanter's network therapy where you had somebody monitor you taking her aunt abuse, she doesn't have that available. What else is, makes it complex? Trauma. Yeah, so she's had, she's got psychiatric comorbidity and trauma and uh, she's, she's also got comorbid pain, right? She's a, she's got a medical issue. That's a factor that may drive some addictive behavior. What else? Multiple substances. Yep, so she uses alcohol and opiates. So she also has an environment problem. So she's in an environment where people are using and she's also underemployed. She has, uh, she has a communications and marketing degree, but she works as a waitress. So she's kind of underemployed and that can be a factor. So we need to meet as many needs of this patient as possible to have a good recovery process for her. And so what do you guys think? What's the intervention? Do you think motivation is important? So she's in this kind of haphazard environment and uh, she's using alcohol out of control some, and so maybe she's at that kind of the pre-contemplative stage in some ways and needs motivation. So we got to get to the leverage. What's her why? You know, how are we going to motivate her to be invested in treatment? And uh, yeah, that's probably the place to start. And then we got to kind of reconstruct her social group and create a healthy environment and, uh, you know, work on pharmacologic ways to treat her addiction. So there's lots to do with this case, right? It's interesting to look at them this way, isn't it? Isn't it interesting? Okay, next slide. 
All right, so multiple substances, medical comorbidity, psychiatric comorbidity, underemployed, and complex social, yes, yeah, so we got it all. Okay, next slide. So Charles Munger, who uh, is the partner of Warren Buffett, so these are billionaires, uh, he said something really wise about addiction. I like this. He says, while susceptibility varies, addiction can happen to any of us through a subtle process where the bonds of degradation are too light to be felt until they are too strong to be broken. And yet, I have yet to meet anyone in over six decades of life whose life was worsened by fear and avoidance of such a deceptive pathway to destruction. One should stay far away from any conduct at all likely to drift into chemical dependency. Even a small chance of suffering so great a damage should be avoided. That's pretty wise words from Charles Munger, huh? Next slide. So what's the view of the future? So the ability to read the complexity of difficult problems is really crucial to excellent care. And I recommend that you kind of be insistent and have a stubborn hope. I often find myself telling patients, you know, I'm stubborn, I've got a stubborn hope. I'm just gonna be persistent and keep working at this. And I think that that's nice for patients to realize that people can be so tenacious. And so you wanna turn your audacious hope into something tangible and ideally just get the job done. All right, next slide. So there's my references. Anybody have any questions? I just wanna say I really appreciate all of the work that you've done and are doing and I got to work with you the other day and it was, you know, for lack of better, it was poetry in motion from my perspective. So I, I think you do very good work. So thank you very much. You know, it's incremental in this field. You know, you, you start out kind of struggling and I've, I've been working in the field for 27 years. So it, it gets easier the longer you, you work in the field, but it, it's a very enjoyable practice. You know, I get a lot of satisfaction helping people. It, it's pretty rewarding. Hi, Dr. Herschler. Hi. I have a question. Um, you mentioned this before, I think, when I worked with you as well, about the stress thing and having kind of the two views of stress as it being good and it also being a problem. When you explain this to patients, I'm just kind of curious, how do they usually like react to that? So patients uh, think stress is terrible. That's kind of the normal view of stress. You know, that stress is miserable and it results in all kinds of problems. And that's why I use substances. I'm so stressed, there's so much trouble. And the consequences of substances cause more stress. And so they tend to be overwhelmed by stress. And so I'll often say, you know, I've got a different take on stress. And I to explain the stress inoculation view of stress. And it kind of opens up their eyes, you know, they say, well, I guess that's true. You know, people with easy lives are not very tough. And so I've been through an awful lot and it has kind of made me more resilient. And they just don't recognize it. They, they, no one's ever taught them to look at things that way. And so it's empowering. You know, I think when working with patients, empowerment is so important. And so I, I try to be calming and empowering in my work with patients. And so being able to face stress bravely and and uh, thrive on stress is really the key to a good life. Any other thoughts, questions? I appreciate how um, you looked at the uppers and the downers, and I see too that uh, people in active addiction feel so out of control that they're trying to control whatever they can which they try and do through drugs. Uh, if they have a lot to do, they wanna go up. If they wanna go to bed, they wanna, or you know, they use downers. So it's that loss of control that they try and control and they do it in maladaptive ways, I guess. Totally agree. So loss of control is the key element of addiction. You know, people who are social drinkers don't have loss of control. And it's that loss of control that's kind of the core element. And so uh, you have to rein that in through uh, helping people with, through pharmacologic interventions 
and through psychotherapy, helping them to play the tape through and think of the consequences. And there is that upper downer pairing that makes it more complex because they're not just treating a low mood or a, an anxiety. There's like a, there's a, there's every little emotion that's off balance they're trying to address and uh, it gets complex. And that can be where the surrender comes into play too. Yes. And so I know in, in AA and NA that surrender is like a spiritual surrender to a higher power. But I kind of I kind of reframe surrender as just saying, look, you know, this life is not working for me. I, I, I can't live this kind of life. I have to live differently. And so that surrender helps them to move forward. Surrender to win, right? Yeah. Any other questions for Dr. Herschler? Thank you for joining me. I'm, I was really happy to have the opportunity to share that with you guys. This is like the core, most important element of being an addiction specialist, is being able to address the complex cases and the, the challenging patients. You want to really be able to manage the most difficult cases. And that, that's what people will be looking for you to be able to do if you're a specialist. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Herschler, for presenting this morning. That was great.